approximately two years ago, we had the opportunity to meet with the family of David Shentau. And in meeting with him, them, uh, we got to hear about a man who I will speak to uh, a little bit about him in a moment, um, who himself was a Holocaust survivor and a Holocaust educator. Um, and his family wanted to memorialize the work that he did in the last number of years of his life in educating all of the youth and others uh, in what happened to the Holocaust. As he said, the more people he educates, the more witnesses there are to such a thing. So last year, before COVID hit, we had the opportunity to really be able to have this event live. And we had at that time, close to 300 people actually came to join with us. And we were very glad to have them all with us. To this year, of course, things have changed. Uh, but nevertheless, to make sure that we would be able to continue to do an event like this one. So first, let me tell you a little bit about who Mr. Shentau was, um, and then we'll get into the program itself. Um, when he was liberated in the end of April in 1945 from Dachau concentration camp, David Shentau weighed just over 76 pounds, but he carried more memories than most men could ever bear. He had survived the Nazi occupation of Belgium, a forced labor camp, the Auschwitz concentration camp, the Warsaw Ghetto, a death march, and Dachau. He went home to Antwerp, Belgium, in the hopes of reuniting with relatives, although he had heard his mother, father, and two sisters had perished in Nazi death camps. He thought that perhaps some of his aunts, uncles, and cousins may come back to the Jewish community center there. The lonely weeks that followed, he said, were the most painful of his life. I realized, he said, that I am the only one, he told the citizen in Ottawa. Out of 17 people, I'm the only one who came back. Tau would start a new life in Canada and go on to become one of Ottawa's best known Holocaust survivors and educators. Later, he probably became one of the best known Holocaust survivors and educators in Ontario. For three decades, he was a tireless witness to history, suffering his memories in classrooms, auditoriums, and museums so that others could understand the truth of the final solution, the Nazi policy that systematically killed almost two every three European Jews in 1945. He explained, when I talk about it, I always feel that I'm not the only witness anymore. All of these people who hear me, they are also witnesses now. For many years, Mr. Shento didn't talk about the Holocaust not even to his children. He only began to recount his ordeal after Ernest Zundel and other Holocaust deniers began to make headlines in the 1980s. Gentau returned four times to Auschwitz to take part in the March of the Living, a Holocaust education program, and he's appeared in many documentary films. He retold his story to students in Belgium, Israel, and across Canada and always asked that his audiences not applaud. I am not an entertainer, he would admonish. I am a witness. David Shentau sadly passed on in 2017 here in Toronto. He was 92 years old. He survived by his wife, Rose, who's in Toronto now. Their two children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. And Mr. Shentau's memory continues on into the future and, the, and that his work will be continued by the endowment of his family to make it possible that every year we will have a lecture and a, an event in memory of Mr. Shentau as we are this evening tonight. Just a moment, I've got a bunch of people to let in. Okay, they're coming in. I would, I, I'd like to just take a moment at this time to welcome with us, there are a number of people, but one of them is the president of our synagogue who was also influential and met together with me and the Shentel extended family. 
And I'd just like to welcome him and have him say a word or two to you. That's Mr. Stuart Haber. Can, uh, can people hear me? Yes. Uh, first, Rabbi, thank you so much for arranging this very important and meaningful evening. And certainly to the Shentel family, I remember when... Okay, uh, uh, sorry, one second. I'm going to uh, mute everyone. Uh, if Mr. Haber, if you would unmute yourself after I do that. Do we just have too many people to leave it on? How's that? Perfect. Okay. So uh, I remember when we met a few years ago, how affected I was by the stories that I heard and the messaging that was very important to the family to give over. And uh, uh, we are all honored at the H. Thornhill Community People. We are all honored that you chose us to help facilitate the messaging of Mr. Shantau. And we are grateful for it. And we will continue year in and year out to ensure that the message gets out, that his message gets out. And uh, I'm sorry for this current venue. Uh, I'd much rather all of us be together as we have been in the past, uh, but it is such as it is. And I hope very soon that we will be able to get together face to face, um, but we will continue to make best efforts to ensure that the venues that we provide and the programs that we create are equal to the profound importance of the message of Mr. Shento. So thank you very much. We are grateful and I look forward to the balance of the program. Thank you, Mr. Haber. Um, again, I'm going to mute everybody again. Um, and then those who are speaking, we're gonna ask you if you would um, unmute at the appropriate time. Uh, first, um, now a, uh, a young woman uh, who really was, um, really played a large role in the organization of this evening's program in um, helping us find the appropriate speaker and helping us in uh, finding the appropriate date. As you know, today is a special date. Um, is a, a young woman by the name of Jody Spiegel, who is a direct, she is the director of the Holocaust Survivor Memoirs Program and the IHRA Delegate at the Azraeli Foundation. Uh, we have her with us this evening. We would like to have her just say a few words as we begin the program. Thank you, Rabbi Rothman, for this opportunity. And thank you for listening to some of the suggestions. It was really exciting working with your team of people to make tonight happen. Um, I had the pleasure of knowing David Shento briefly as part of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. My first year, it was hosted in Canada, in Ottawa, and I was able to hear him share his story. And you could hear a pin drop. The room was silent. And we heard from a witness to history and the fact that this storytelling, the sharing continues today is very important. As you all know, today is the United Nations International Holocaust Remembrance Day. And so it's not a Jewish day of remembrance and commemoration. It's a day that was marked by the allies um, to, to ensure we remember the liberation of the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp 76 years ago. Our day of remembrance, obviously, as we all know, is on Yom HaShoah, which happens to fall on, I think it's the 27th of Nisan, but it's just a few days after Pesach. And what we're still trying to commemorate around that time of year is the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And while that we know took place on air of Pesach, it continued on, it, didn't, it wasn't just a few days. One of those witnesses to the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising is um, a brilliant man that I am lucky to know his name is Pinchas Gutter, and he'll be sharing some thoughts with you today. I was lucky to meet Pinchas um, as an amazing survivor speaker and later as one of our authors. We published his memoir, Memories in Focus, and Pinchas and I have traveled together and we've worked together for a long time. 
I'm not going to tell you anything more about Pinchas because he does a far better job than I do. But he did grow up um, in a Hasidic family in Poland. And there's this Hasidic idea that when you tell a story, that itself can save the world. By sharing one story, we can save the memory of a person. And perhaps that idea is that in keeping a memory alive, you prevent what's sometimes called a second death, the death that happens when an event or a person is forgotten. We can't let that happen. And so we will continue to share the stories of our survivors. And thank you all so much for this merit of being able to pass the stories and share them with each other. And whatever you hear tonight, you then become a witness to then share with others. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jody. Your, your words came from the heart. They enter the heart. And I'm sure it's a, a wonderful preface for what we're about to do this evening. Um, I'm again going to mute everyone because more people have joined. Um, and I will ask our speakers to unmute at the appropriate time. Okay, um, now um, we, we, we added a, a, a small thing just for uh, this evening that we don't do each year, but um, we were sorry to hear that Rabbi Ruven Bulka, who was actually the, the rabbi in Ottawa, where Mr. Shentau was for many years, um, who we had originally were trying to see if we could get him to join us. We had heard that he's quite ill. So we've asked uh, one of the members of our synagogue, who's originally from Ottawa, and who knows Rabbi Bulka well, if he would join us and just recite one paragraph or one capital of Tehillim as a, a, as a way to ask for a complete refuah, refuah shlema for Rabbi Bulka. We've asked Rabbi Haskell Bahar, as I mentioned, is originally from Ottawa and um, is with us now. And I'd like to and, and um, the psalm that he is going to be saying, I have put into the chat. If you open up the chat, you'll notice that the first one is a, a JPEG of one psalm. Um, he will be reciting this psalm um, as a way, again, for a complete and immediate recovery from all in the illness for, of course, for Rabbi Bulka. So uh, Rabbi Bahar, if you would join us. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. And thank you, Rabbi Rothman, for including me in the lecture. I'm, I'm honored. May the neshama of David Shentau have an aliyah, and may the family of David Shentau have arichas yamim v'shanim, long, happy, and prosperous lives. Um, some of you may know that I grew up in Ottawa, and my mother, Sheila Bahar, resides at the Hillel Lodge. My father was uh, Eric Bahar, al and my uncle Sam, Sam Ages, was very active in the Jewish community. He was the head of the Heber Kedisha for many years, as well as other things that he did in Ottawa. I was fortunate to attend the uh, Jewish Cheder in Ottawa, the Hillel Academy, and um, I was there from grade one till grade 10. Rabbi Bulka was my Rebbe in grade eight and grade nine, and I've been in touch with him ever since. I'm honored to say a few words about my dear Rebbe and recite the Tehillim for Rufush Lema. Being a rabbi in a small city is an extremely arduous task. A small city rabbi doesn't have the conveniences of a big city. When Rabbi Bulka arrived in Ottawa, there were no kosher restaurants, very few observant Jewish families, and no kolel. A lot has changed since then, thanks to Rabbi Bulka and others. I met Rabbi Bulka, as I said, in grade eight. He introduced our class to the Talmud. Suffice it to say that he was and is a brilliant Talmud Chacham and a great orator, as everyone knows. But what impressed me the most in grade eight was that he was an accomplished baseball player. He could hit the ball out of the schoolyard with ease. I guess in those days he was in his 20s. And um, that was how he related to all of us. He related to us on our level. Rabbi Bulka's greatest asset is that he is a real mensch. He's kind and he's humble and he's comfortable with everyone he meets. When you speak to Rabbi Bulka, you speak to a friend. Ottawa has had a plethora of great Jewish leaders come and go over the years, but Rabbi Bulka stayed and helped nurture and build a strong community, strong in Torah and strong in mitzvahs, and that's no easy feat. Our sages teach us 
that King David's Psalms shatter all barriers. They affect and accomplish great outcomes with kindness and compassion. Allow me to offer this Psalm as a refuah shalema to my Rebbe and to Ottawa's Rabbi, Rabbi Boka. Shiramalos mima makim karasicha Adonai Adonai shima vikoli tiena oznecha kashuvos vikol tachanunai ima vonos tishmar yadonai miyamod ima chasli chalmanti vare kivisi adonai kivsanafshi Belidvaro Halti Nafshi Ladonai mi Shomrim Laboker Shomrim Laboker Yachel Yisrael El Adonai Ki im Adonai Chesed Beharbe imo Fedus Behu Yiftes Yisrael Mikol Avonosav Before Shalema. Thank you very much, Rabbi Bahar. Uh, we appreciate your words. And again, words that come from the heart, enter the heart. And certainly we all wish Rabbi Bulka, who was Rabbi Shentau's rabbi and, and uh, confidant, that we should wish him a, a Rafua Shlema. So and now we are going to, um, first I would like to welcome, although they've, they've all offer, uh, did not agree to say anything, but we do want to welcome pretty much much of and most of the Shentau extended family who are with us today, who have sponsored and made this event possible. And we'd like to welcome them to this evening, um, the second annual of these events that we've done. So now it's, it's time for our guest speaker, Mr. Pinchas Gutar. If I could, I would give you just a bit of an introduction and then we'll get to the main purpose of our evening. Mr. Gutar was born into a well-established Hasidic family who traced their roots back 400 years in Poland. He was born in Lodz and was seven years old when the war broke out. And he, along with his twin sister and the entire family, fled to what they thought was safety in Warsaw after his father had been brutally beaten by Nazis in Lodz. Pinchas and his family were incarcerated in the Warsaw ghetto for three and a half years until April of 1943. And during the first three weeks of the ghetto uprising, his family's bunker was discovered and they were deported to the death camp of Majenik. The day the family arrived after a horrendous journey, Pinchas' father, mother, and twin sister were murdered by the Nazis. He was sent to a work camp where people were beaten, shot, or worked to death. And he passed through several other concentration camps, including Buchenwald, and worked at loading and unloading enormous weights of iron and other slave work. Towards the end of the war, he was forced into a death, death march from Germany to Therenstadt in Czechoslovakia, where he barely survived. He was liberated by the Russians in 1945 and put under the auspices of the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration and was taken to Britain with other youths to be rehabilitated. After spending many years in South Africa, he emigrated to Canada, where he now resides. Pinchas divides his time between speaking out against the Holocaust, volunteering as a chaplain, and he is the honorary full-time cantor in the Kiever Shul. So now, while I'm going to once again mute everyone to make sure that we don't have um, really any, you know, any, um, any bleeding of sounds, of noise coming through, we would like to welcome Mr. Pinchas Guter. So Mr. Guter, if you would just un, um, uh, unmute yourself and then we can begin. Thank you. Uh, shalom everyone, good evening. Uh, it is an honor for me to be here tonight, especially on this particular day, which is a day where we commemorate the liberation of uh, Auschwitz and which is designated by the United Nations as the Holocaust, you know, Remembrance Day. And I, what I would like to do is, uh, I would like to, to actually start off by speaking about what we lost. 
what what my life was and describe to you what my life was before the war in Poland in in Łódź and give you an, a, a a a picture of of the wonderful life regardless of poverty and regardless of all kinds of other things uh, the 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 life that we lost so let me start off i was a member of a Hasidic family in Łódź. My grandfather was a notable in Łódź. He was a uh, he was the Rosh Machzikea Dat. He was a it was an NGO where people were were being uh, were being. Uh, 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 we studied to become rabbis, and uh, I, 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 we, we had a family of, of close to 150 people. So let me describe the demographics of Wuj. Wuj was a city of about 750,000 people, of which there were 250,000 Jewish people living in Wuj. Most of them were workers. They were textile workers, glaciers, uh, steel workers, but most of them were reasonably poor. Some of them, there was a wealthy small community, but the majority of them were really very poor. But regardless of everything, it was a very rich Jewish religious community. To describe my own community for my own family by itself, uh, my father uh, was a winemaker. My grandfather was a winemaker, and according to my grandfather, uh, he had a parchment written like, you know, you write the Torah on, which he had the genealogical story of our family. And according to him, we lived in Poland for over 400 years, and there were always winemakers in our family. I have got uh, records that in Łódź itself, close to 100 years, we were making wines in 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 Wuj itself. So let me explain to you a little bit about my own personal life. My mother gave birth to me and my sister, and she couldn't have any children after that. So we were a very small immediate family. It was my father, my sister, and I, and of course my mother. We were sharing two apartments in Zachodnia in the center of, of Wuj, together with my grandfather. My grandfather had a separate firm, uh, apartment. He was 78 years old by, by, the, by the time the war broke out. And there was an interleading door so that my parents could look after my grandfather and my grandmother. When I was about three or three and a half years old, my grandfather took me to the Cheder and he gave me a bag of sweets and he took me, we walked together, I held his hand and we came into a room where little children were sitting on the floor ar around and there was a melamed and each one gave a sweet to the other one. And this is how I started my learning. I started my learning, my, the, the Chumash, the, the Old Testament and the Bible when I was about three and a half years old. But at the same time, I also started my life as a worker. When I was about the same age, my father took me down to the cellars and he started to teach me how I'm going to become a winemaker. He took a small table and he put about a dozen bottles of wine. I can't remember exactly the number, but they had no labels. And each one had a number on it from one to whatever. And he put next the little cup next to it and he poured some wine into each one of these. And he then told me I must go and I must inhale the aroma of the, uh, the scents of these wines. So he just said, go ahead and go to each cup and inhale the aroma, the scent of this wine. So I did that. When he was satisfied that I was finished, he told me to turn around and he then took away all the bottles, mixed up all the cups 
gave me a little cup and he said to me, I want you to please tell me from which bottle this cup came from. And of course, I didn't know at all. In the beginning, I knew nothing about how to do that. But slowly, slowly, I learned how to distinguish what kind of a grape it was, whether it came from Hungary, whether it came from Italy, whether it came from Palestine, because my grandfather had uh, vineyards in Palestine and he also had vineyards in Hungary. Uh, so I started becoming a productive individual, both in learning and both in, as a worker, I was going to become a master winemaker. And this is how life started for me in, in Łódź in Poland. I just want to share with you, for example, uh, what Łódź was all about. You take, for example, uh, a Shabbat. There were many synagogues, lots of shnibuts. For example, in our building, there was a shnibu downstairs. And as a matter of fact, I was circumcised in that shnibu. And, and all our, uh, all our uh, prayers were in that particular shnibu. Nobody was sitting, only the elderly people had benches around the side. Everybody was standing and there was always people davening and studying in that shnibu. And, and it was really wonderful. On Shabbat, if you walked out into the street of uh, Wuj, you could see people with talisim, people with the strimals, people walking up, ladies with their children's uh, little, uh, uh, children's uh, vigala, and they would go and talk. And it was always, it was a wonderful place to live in. Of course, there was anti-Semitism, and I'm going to, and I'm going to describe to you two, in, two instances where I, uh, uh, you know, experienced or personally anti-Semitism before the war. But it didn't affect me. I was a happy child. When I was about four and a half to five years old, I unfortunately, became ill with pneumonia. And pneumonia was very dangerous in those days. And I still remember the doctor that treated me was Dr. Hirschwinkel. And uh, he managed to get sulfur drugs from Vienna. He, uh, uh, and slowly, slowly, I started recovering. My mother, you know, I slept in my parents' room. My mother was saying, kill him all the time. And they, you know, we were quite superstitious. You know, we learned a lot of things from the Christian uh, community. So we had like uh, white doves floating around. It was quite an interesting situation for me as a child, but I was very ill. When I started recovering, I was sent to the mountains to live with mountain people called Gurale. And these Gurale, I lived in their huts with the animals and everything to try and recover. You know, the, 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 the Tatra Mountains was a range between Czechoslovakia and Poland. It, Poland generally is a very flat country, very forested, but, but uh, Czechoslovakia and, and Poland had a border, the Tatra Mountains. And there, Shavnitsa uh, was a place where people would drink the waters and recover from lung diseases. So I was sent in for, I was there for several months living there. I was always interested in music. There were no chazonim in my uh, family, but I was very interested in, in davening and listening to music. So on Sundays, uh, there was a, there, there was a, uh, uh, a, a kind of a very large park. And in the park, uh, the, the, the local mu musician, the local uh, army uh, band and the police band and the uh, lo lots of other, uh, you know, school bands and others used to come and play. And I used to run down from the mountain and listen to it. And on the way back, there was a very large church going up to the mountain. So I would stop outside. Uh, Poland was a very religious country and they always had mass. And I would listen to the music and to the sounds of the choir. Of course, I didn't go into the church because a Jewish little boy wouldn't be able to go there. But one day I must have been so enveloped in the sound of this wonderful, whether it was Bach or Mozart, I can't, obviously can't remember what it was, but I slowly went towards the church. I did not go inside, but I knelt on the first step and I was listening. I was in, in kind of very much involved in listening to the music. And suddenly 
somebody started hitting me from the back. I looked around and there was a middle-aged man and he said to me, how dare you, you dirty little Jew, con you know, uh, dirty the soil, uh, contaminate the soil of our Holy Mother's Church. And he chased me away. And I went back to the mountain. I lived with Christian Poles and I was, I was quite a happy child. I was running around and, and, and playing and uh, being on the, there was a river, it was like Switzerland. And I was very happy. The second time that I experienced antisemitism before the war was when my mother and I used to go walking in, in, in woods quite often. And uh, one day we were walking in the street, in our street, and uh, my mother was a blonde, very, very beautiful uh, Scandinavian looking woman. And I was blonde. The children, we were all blue, blue eyed and blonde and we were all blue eyed and blonde. So we were walking, but I had little payers and I was dressed like a little Jewish boy with a hat and everything, but my mother could pass for anything. And I remember, a man, I still remember exactly what he looked like. It was autumn because he had a fur uh, 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 kind of uh, a, a, co a, a coat with, with a fur collar. And he had one of these funny cravats, you know, the, the old style cravats. And he had a, sil a cane with a silver head. And, and, uh, and he walked up and I thought he stopped my mother to ask something. But he went up and he said to her, how is it possible for you, such a beautiful Polish Christian woman, to work for these dirty Jews and you are as a maid or something like that? And my mother didn't answer. She just crossed the road. And from that time on, I remember quite often when she saw that she was going to be accosted or anything like that, we used to cross the road. And these are the two things that I remember. Otherwise, I was a very happy child. But all this ended on the 1st of September, 1939, when the Nazis attacked Poland and within about a week or seven, eight days, they arrived in Łódź. And immediately upon the arrival, they, um, they started with all kinds of rules and regulations against Jews. And they also had lists of uh, notables and it wasn't only Jewish notables, they, they, you know, Wuj had a, about 100,000 ethnic Germans who were left over from the times when Poland was ruled for 150 years by the Russian, Prussian, and Austro-Hungarian Empire. So they, they were ethnic Germans and they all became Volksdeutsche. And so they were also, before the war, they obviously they were like a fifth column and they uh, prepared for the Gestapo and for the security service, lists of notables. And the notables were not only Jewish, but my grandfather, who was a notable, was on, on the list. They must have got it from uh, the Jewish Community Council. There was always a, 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 a gmina, a Jewish gmina in, 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 in the big cities and even in the small cities. And basically, this is what how he came about to be on this list. So when uh, you remember I told you we had these two small apartments with uh, two doors that you could come in from the outside, but with the interleading door. The war was still raging. It was about two weeks after the war started. And suddenly uh, there was a ring at my grandfather's door. My father went through the interleading door, opened the door, and there were the, these two Gestapo men with black coats and uh, they asked for Chimaya Guter. I mean, they asked for him for Yitzhak, mayor or whatever. Then my name of my grandfather's name was that they could say. And my father took them into the bedroom and he said, he's lying in bed. He's 78 years old. And he uh, just had an operation before the war started. And he is very sick. And one of them said to the other, there's also in Krapirn. And because I knew Yiddish, I, I still remember the word. Krapirn, you mean he's going to kind of peg out, he's going to die, so we're not going to take him. Then they asked my father, who are you? And my father said, I am the son. What do you do? I'm a winemaker. Where do you make wine? Novomirska number 19. They took him away. They beat him almost to death. They threw him in a corner 
and they asked the German military police that all the trucks that are going to the front, they must come downstairs and help it, uh, to the cellar and help themselves to whatever they want. There were about 11,000 bottles of different wines and liqueurs because uh, we had a concession from, uh, from Austria uh, 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 that making brandy, stock, I don't, today it is even today, stocks, brandy, and uh, we were making all kinds of different things. We weren't only making Yiddish, Kodesh, kosher wine for Jews. We were also making wine for the whole of, of which. We were the second largest winemakers in Poland in, by 1939. Then after about 24 or 48 hours, I don't remember how long that took, they destroyed everything. They even destroyed the big vets. They took the wine in jerry cans and they left. The, how, the, the caretaker of the, of the complex saw them taking my father downstairs, but when they left, he didn't come out. So he went downstairs to, to find him. And he was lying in a corner, but he wasn't dead. He was unconscious. So this man say, actually risked his life. He was a Christian Pole who put him on his, on his, on his, on his uh, splicers, uh, on his... Uh, back and he it was already uh, uh, the, the, you weren't allowed uh, to go after six o'clock uh, but they, he brought him to our home and the same doctor Dr. Hershwit you started treating him and within a week or so he uh, started recovering when the war finished uh, my grand, my father had a younger sister who was married in uh, somebody in Warsaw and it was decided that it was safer to be in Warsaw because Warsaw was going to be the general government and Luge was going to be incorporated in the German Reich. It actually was, it became Litzmannstadt. And uh, uh, so we as uh, blonde and blue eyed, they cut off my piles, I cry cried. And, but of course I had no choice. Uh, I was going on eight by that time. And my mother and the two of us, the two little children went to the station because Jews couldn't, by that time, Jews couldn't uh, uh, travel by train. They couldn't, they, yeah, they couldn't do anything. They were outlaws. So we went as Christians and we took a train and we went to Warsaw and joined up with our arm. My father, who was Jewish looking and he, his Polish speech was recognizable as being Jewish. So he walked. He walked at, at night and during the day, friendly farmers would hide him in their barns. And then at the same time, there were big forests in Poland. So he would hide himself in the forest, cover himself with leaves. And it took him about two and a half months or more to arrive in Warsaw. Warsaw was not much different uh, in, from the point of view of persecution of, of the Jews. This little boy, uh, who, I, I wasn't scared. I don't know why. So I couldn't stay in the house and I would always go outside and being blonde and blue eyed nobody nobody did anything to me because everybody assumed that I was you know I was wearing an ordinary hat and I was wearing ordinary clothes I not, nothing to rec me recognize me as being a Jewish boy and so much so that you know I witnessed all kinds of terrible things for example uh, you know, ordinary German soldiers, not SS, not anything, they wouldn't have guns, but they had bayonets on their left-hand side. And they would go out and grab a few Jews, elderly Jews with their beards, and they get uh, young women, and they made them dance like uh, monkeys. At the same time, they would try and take off their beards, and they, and, and they would make, take, take their skin off. And this little boy observed all these things. Uh, soldiers uh, used to uh, do all kinds of things. They, a Jew could be, you could do anything. Anybody could do anything to him. You could stop him, take everything out of his pockets, and there was no, uh, you, you, you had no help from anybody. There was already a Polish police, collaborative police. There were German police, but you couldn't go and complain that somebody robbed you because you became an own entity. Jews were, 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 were nobody. And they also started catching people 
surrounding st uh, streets and then bringing lorries, putting people in, in there. It doesn't matter if they, who they were, whether they were older or not, they would take them to start. Warsaw was bombarded to start, you know, heavy work and they would beat them while it was going on. And this little boy, you know, observed all these things. Another thing that happened, you know, when there was a row outside shops to buy food, you know, when a Jew came, they would push him to the end unless they chased him away sometimes altogether. And my mother had an idea. She said she would give me the money and I must go out. And there's a little boy, you know, blonde, blue eyed and uh, quite reasonably looking. I came to the row and of course, everybody feels sorry for a little boy. They would push me to the front. And so I went to the baker, I went to whatever I needed to the grocery and I would buy their things. And, for, and by that time there were 17 people living in my, uh, aunt's place in the Lokhtral no, number 14. And until my father arrived, I was the supplier of food for our, for a family that my, 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 uh, my father's elder sister arrived there and with her husband, Moishe Shloim Levinson and his children, there were 17 people uh, that were living in this little apartment. Then my father arrived he managed to find a very small apartment on Nadevki number 49, which was the corner of Mila. And later on, you know, you will realize that Mila was a very important street uh, from the point of view of the resistance. And uh, so this was the corner of Mila number 49, Nadevki and Mila and Mila number three. The front of the building was destroyed by a bomb, but the rest of it stayed. Uh, Polish buildings uh, are built like quadrangles with a courtyard in, inside. So he found a little apartment on the first or second floor. I don't remember. I think it was the second floor. And uh, with the ablutions and the bathroom was in the hallway and we shared with others. So the little kitchen and the little bedroom, we all slept in the bedroom and the little kitchen, my father, he had to make a living. So he started, he bought uh, raisins on the black market and he sent me out to cafes. This was no, the ghetto, there was no ghetto yet. And I went around ghettos collecting bottles. He would clean the bottles. I remember still, he put the, the bottles in water for three days to make them kosher. He, he, had, he bought on the black market raisins and he started a still and he started creating kosher wine. And on Fridays, he would give me a rucksack and I would, and, and addresses, and I would take this to Jews who could afford to buy the wine. And this is how we started making a living. And this is how we started off. My mother had a little kiosk where she was selling cigarettes and sweets. And this is all before the uh, ghetto was closed up. In November of 1940, the, the, in the beginning, there was not going to be a ghetto, then there wasn't going to be, a, there was going to be a ghetto and within, and by November 19, uh, and then they started building the walls of the ghetto around about, I think it was either September, or October. And by, the, by November, we, fortunately, our building was in the ghetto. So we had, didn't have to move. But 350,000 Jews that lived in, the, in, in, in Warsaw out of a, population of 1,350,000 had to cramp into an area which was less than 3% of the area of Warsaw, of the city of Warsaw. By that time, the Nazis created a Judenrat, they created a Jewish police, they created a Jewish prison, they created a post office, they created all kinds of things as just being a kind of, you know, independent little entity, except this little independent entity was not independent at all. Uh, the Nazis would come every day to our uh, 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 Judenrat and they would come to the uh, to, to Chernyakov, who was the eldest of the of the, 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 the of the Judenrat, and he would uh, you know take orders from them. He had to deliver so many people for work. Uh, the Nazis started. Uh, you know, uh, started building factories in inside the ghetto. They built a lot of a lot of German concerns. Uh, ordinary German concerns started building factories outside the ghetto. So every day 
people had to walk, march to, to outside of the ghetto with the, with the armed guard and Jewish police, uh, so forth and so on, but they got very little food. And I can tell you, for example, officially, we were only allowed approximately 180 calories a day per person per day. And most of the food was made from erzatz, the food that came in. And this is how life started in the Warsaw Ghetto. In November, the walls were closed. The, the gates were guarded now by Nazis, Polish police, and uh, Jewish police. And things started getting really very bad inside the ghetto. Because even those people that were working for the Germans inside the ghetto or outside the ghetto, they got a little bit of food and a little bit of money, but not enough to actually support their families. Unfortunately, there was also a black market. But when I say unfortunately, at the same time, it was fortunate. Why? Because the black market started bringing food into the Warsaw Ghetto and people started selling because by that, at that time, uh, a lot of uh, Christian, uh, Polish Christians from the Aryan side were allowed to come into the Warsaw Ghetto. So there was like a market. They would bring in food and people would start selling everything. First, of course, they started selling their valuables. Slowly, they started selling clothing, uh, bedding, everything they could to get some food. So in that, for that instance, the, the, uh, the, the black market was actually very important in supplying the Warsaw Ghetto with food. Unfortunately, also, there were a lot of Jewish collaborators. Uh, I believe in telling the truth. I believe that everybody should know exactly what happened. And for example, in the Warsaw Ghetto, there was a Jewish Gestapo, and they called them the Chinastka. Chinastka is in Polish, the number 13. And the reason why is because they had their headquarters at number 13 Leszno Street. And they had their heads, they had green bands around their heads and different uh, uh, head uh, armbands. The armbands that they closed weren't like the Jewish police. The Jewish police had blue uh, in their heads. They, had, uh, they, they, were, they, they were blue, blue heads uh, surrounded by a blue band and they had green bands. And this, they became collaborationists, and they were the main suppliers of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, black black market. So on the one hand, they did terrible things. For example, they knew that a lot of Jewish merchants kept you know a lot of their stuff behind to slowly try and sell it. But they would go and tell their uh, collaborating Nazi Gestapo where these people were, and they would rob them, and they would share. And it was really an apocalyptic hell in the Warsaw Ghetto. So I can only tell you a little bit, but this little boy went around and was still collecting bottles from my father who was still making wine because that was the only way. My mother stopped. She couldn't buy any more black market uh, sweets or chocolates or things like that. So she closed down her kiosk. And the only thing she did, she started buying flour on the black market and making little hullers. And I became the purveyor of wine and hullers for people who could afford it for Friday night, you know, for, Shab for Shabbos. And this is how we were making a living. But at the same time, I was most of the week, I, I couldn't stay at home. My sister stayed at home with my mother, but I was running around the street. And I saw scenes that are incredible to even describe. For example, ordinary German officers would come in convertible cars, and as they were driving through the ghetto, they would take out the revolvers. I don't know if they were drunk or not, and they would start shooting at people like you go, you know, on a, on a, on a game run, you know, like you go looking for, for, for animals and, 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 and look, you know, hunting. They were hunting Jews. Uh, at the same time, there was continuous arrests and all kinds of terrible people. Uh, terrible things were happening in the Warsaw Ghetto. And one of the worst things is because of 
the, the, the fact that there were so many people and they were bringing in more and more from the surrounding little towns, by the end of the middle of 1941, there must have been close to 400 or 450,000 people in the ghetto. So the Jewish Judenrat decided that they would, they, they had to, they were in control. So all the buildings were, uh, had, had the caretakers and they decided how many people there would be per room. So some rooms had eight people, some rooms had nine people. Our apartment was so small that the only thing that happened is that at night, my father used to go out and bring people to sleep in the little kitchen because it was so small that they couldn't push more people inside to, to, to be there. And they realized also, the caretaker realized that it was also a place where my father was creating the wine and he had to make a living. And I presume he also bribed him because these caretakers were, were, were quite uh, important individuals and they, they, they were very difficult to deal with. So all in all, life in the Warsaw Ghetto was terrible. But at the same time, uh, I, I also have to say that everything that the Nazis did not allow us to do, we were doing. I, my father, with this little money that he had, found a Melamed and in, in an underground room, I went and I studied Nadurim at Nran. I'm sure a lot of you know Nadurim is a very difficult Mesechte, but I went and studied that. And I was only, uh, at that time, I was nine, nine years old. And there were another seven or eight youngsters we were studying. We weren't allowed to, to daven, we weren't allowed to do anything, but we did everything. People had underground universities. There was a health self-help society that started by the intellectuals of the Warsaw Ghetto. And they started soup kitchens. So at least people who were dying in hunger, they were given at least a plate of soup and a piece of bread on a daily basis. The Judenrat itself also started soup kitchens. And this is how life went on. But unfortunately, because of the crowding, and because of what was going on in the Warsaw Ghetto, people started dying. And from the beginning of 1941, you started finding people dying in the street. So when this little boy went around and his eyes were lenses and the screen of his mind was celluloid, he started photographing these scenes. So I was standing outside the cafe where I wanted to go and get some empty bottles for my father. And inside, collaborationists, Gestapo, uh, Polish police were dancing and singing and, and uh, doing all, and, 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 and the geese were being roasting and I could smell the, the scents of these, uh, all these meats and stuff that, that was coming out of these cafes. And there were many cafes in the, in the Warsaw Ghetto. So this is why I, I, I talk about it uh, being an apocalyptic hell, a schizophrenic, schizophrenic uh, idea, uh, you know, uh, living in the Warsaw Ghetto. And this went on for quite a long time. And people dying more and more and more. And I want to describe to you, we had a Hevre Kaddisha that used to walk around with wooden carts and collect people like you collect garbage. Can you imagine? That you walk around, that Hebra Kaddisha, collect people. People were either lying naked or people were lying covered with newspapers or people were stripped of their clothing or sometimes they were clothed because other people took it off to, to, to dress themselves or, or to sell it to Christians to make some food. And people started dying by the hundreds. So much so that the Hebra Kaddisha couldn't cope with taking all these people on their wooden cards. Said so they would catch men, you know, and the police would catch men, give them wheelbarrows and take these, these poor people who died in the streets and take them to the cemetery, the Jewish cemetery, where a big, huge pit was dug. And they would, pit, they would throw them in without prayers, without anything. If you had money in the Warsaw Ghetto, you could still have a proper burial. If you were a notable, if you're somebody that the Judenrat decided there was a, like a rabbi or somebody, they would still give him a funeral. But otherwise, people were being, you know, taken to the, to the, to the cemetery like, like garbage. And today, if you go to the Jewish cemetery, that pit is now covered, but you can, close to 100,000 people died in the Warsaw Ghetto. 
This went on until the 22nd of July, 1942. In 1942, on the 2nd of July, there were placards on the wall saying, because of the crowding, because of unemployment, because of sickness, we are going to relocate. They didn't use the word deportation. They didn't use, they used relocate. They offered people three kilo bread and uh, marmalade for the journey. And people went voluntarily to the Umstadtplatz and they started going, uh, you know, to be taken away. And every day, uh, uh, you know, cattle trucks full of people were being driven out of the Warsaw Ghetto. But we didn't know where they were going. So the, there was a Jewish resistance always in the Warsaw Ghetto, right from the beginning. It's not true that it started later. The youngsters created, and they were always doing things to try and find out what was going on. So they smuggled themselves along the route of these where these were going, especially when on the Umstadtplatz, the Jewish police that were functioning there noticed that the, 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 the cattle trucks, they, they all have numbers, and, and so has the, 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 the numbers were, were on it, that a train would leave at nine o'clock in the morning or eight o'clock in the morning, and a few hours later, by lunchtime or afternoon, it will be back. So it couldn't have gone very far. So they, they tried to find out. And they found out that these trains were going to a place called Treblinka. And I'm sure most of you know what Treblinka was all about. And when they arrived, there were, uh, you know, flags with the red cross and men with white coats with megaphones saying, this is a way station. You're going to be disinfected. If you've got shoes with the shoelaces, you must tie them together so you can find them after you were disinfected and you're going to continue the journey, except, of course, they didn't continue the journey. The journey finished up in the guest chambers of Treblinka. And they came back and they told us. Uh, in the beginning, I think a lot of people wouldn't believe. My father, who was a very timid man, but he, I think because he was beaten by the Nazis, he never trusted them. So we were hidden all the time. Despite the fact that they were issuing all kinds of documents for, for people, they were playing games. They issued red documents, blue documents, green documents. I don't remember what the color was, but each time they would change the documents and then would take more and more people to there to murder them in Treblinka. But we were hidden most of the time, all over the place. So we lost it in the, in, in, during the deportation until Erev Pesach on the 19th of April, when the big uprising started. You remember I told you that the front of our building was destroyed by a bomb, and it was the corner of Mila and Nalevki. So underneath that, within the, a few months be, from January, I think, when the first resistance started, they started digging a bunker. There were lots of bunkers in the Warsaw Ghetto uh, that were dug, and they, dug a, a, a bunker underneath it for 150 people and they put air vents into where the uh, ruins were of the destroyed building because it was never cleared up. And on the 19th of April, Erev Pesach, we went down to the bunker because the resistance, the, the, the Nazis came to take away the, the, the rest of, our, of, our, of about 50 or 60,000 people that were still living in the Warsaw Ghetto. And one of the things that I must tell you, the resilience and the spirituality and the, 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 the endeavor of, of Judaism, of, 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 our, of, our, of our humanity, of our, we, when we went down to the cellar, my father must have had a few bottles of wine left over. And the baker, because there was a lull between January and April, there were bakers make, baking bread and they must have baked some matzos. So we, in that bunker, when they were shooting and killing people upstairs, we had a Seder. We cried. I mean, most of these people were Hasidic Jews. They knew the Haggadah off by heart. So we celebrated the... We celebrated Pesach, Erev Pesach, in that bunker. And we were praying for deliverance. We were ce celebrating the deliverance of the Jews, of the slaves of, of from Egypt, but also praying for deliverance, you know, praying to God for deliverance for us. 
we were in that bunker for nearly three weeks. And in May, the first week of May, we were discovered and uh, a, a, uh, we could hear through the air vents came voices I, in German and in Polish saying, if you don't come out, we're going to throw gas bombs inside, you're all going to die. We came out and we went to the Umschlagplatz. In the Umschlagplatz, where, where the deportations were, there were buildings which were used to be an old school and a Jewish uh, hospital before that. There were little rooms. They pushed in as many people as they could. You couldn't even lie down. You could only kind of squat. And they kept us there. We were there for two days and one night. And you weren't allowed to go out. So you can imagine women with children, elderly men, young men, uh, 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 about over a hundred people in a little in a little room. Uh, everything was had to be done there. No water, no food. Ukrainians were the main people that were, you know, that were guarding us and Lithuanians and Latvians. They were the ones that, that, that were doing most of the terrible work in the Warsaw Ghetto while the deportation started. And they, if you gave them something valuable, uh, they would give you some water. So my father, I saw him take off my mother's wedding ring. He went to the door and he asked the Ukrainian who were guarding and he gave him a big bottle of water. My father had a sock of sugar and a teaspoon and he gave each child a teaspoon of sugar and a little bit of water and I never saw them uh, touch that sugar or water. It was given to the children only. We were then chased into the wagons and when they were chasing us down the the, the stairs, they were beating us with, with the rifle butts, with wooden things, and we were, and sh with dogs and shooting people and the running and you, 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 I mean, it's, I can't imagine, I can see the scenes because they're all indelible in my mind, but I can't imagine that this actually happened to me. And we were pushed into the wagon and my father managed to, to like an angel, to take us near to that little window with a with a barbed with a barbed wire, uh, so that we could breathe, because they pushed so many people in, it became difficult to breathe inside. And we were, and, and I knew we were going to Treblinka, we were going to die. And we started the, the train started going, and I don't remember how long we were we were in that train, but we arrived in Lublin, uh, in a place called Majdanek, which was also a death camp where people were being gassed. And we got off the train. A lot of people had died during the journey. And uh, we walked to Majdanek to the concentration camp. When we arrived there, they separated men from women. My father told me that I must say, I was quite tall for my age. I was a head taller than my, my twin sister. He said, say that you are five years older. So I went, with, my father took me with the men. So I was standing with my father with the men. My mother was separated from my sister. She was pushed with the children. So my mother, I was watching my mother and suddenly my sister must have watched also my mother and she started running and she ran towards my mother. And my sister had a beautiful blonde braid. And, and as she was running, I was watching that braid and she, she hugged my mother. And as she hugged my mother, I was watching the braid. And after that, my brain did something terrible. It made me forget everything. I can't remember my sister at all, nor her face, nor anything about her. We lived together for 11 years. We were born together and I cannot remember anything. We used to go to collect the children in, when we were in, in, in Wuj before the war from the baker on Saturday. So I can, I know that she's standing on the other side holding the pot, the handle of the other pot and walking together with me, but I can't see her. I cannot see. I have, I have images of all my family, of my aunt, uncles, and everybody, but I can't see my sister. And the first time I told this, which was about 20 years ago, I broke down and I couldn't take it because it's so difficult for me that I don't even have a memory of a picture of my sister in my brain. All I see is the brain, the brain and nothing but the brain.
Then they took the women and the children, they took everybody away, and we were the last standing there. Then they chased us into a barrack. They told us to address naked. And I was, I knew I was going to die. And, they, and we were running with our, naked with our hands in, in the air. And there was a man standing with a white coat, with a cane, pushing people right, left, right, left, left. I didn't know that, that there were two, that the gas chamber was here and the, there was something else there. And I came into a room with shower heads and I knew that there was going to be guests coming out and I was going to die. So I said my prayers and I was waiting to die, but water came in. Water came down from those showers in my place. So then we were chased into another barracks, giving the you know, striped closing, prison closing. And then I ran out outside. There was, you know, we were waiting for, for, for what they, we were going to do, what they were going to tell us to do. And I was looking for my father because I saw that if I am alive, my father was alive. And I ran around, I ran around looking, and then I found the man who used to come and sleep at our kitchen sometimes in Warsaw, in the ghetto. And I asked him, I said, did you see my father? Did you see my father? And obviously he knew much more than what I did. I was an innocent child. And he didn't answer. And then suddenly, eventually, after me really going at him and pushing him, he lifted his eyes to heaven. And I knew that my father was murdered by the Nazis. And afterwards, I found out that the same day, both my mother and my sister were murdered by the Nazis. I was three months in Maidanek. And the reason why I survived Maidanek is because I made myself invisible. And I made myself invisible in the fact that there was a, like a garden in front of our uh, barrack. And as they, st every morning when they brought, woke us up for work groups and, 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 uh, and so forth and so on, I laid myself down uh, and started fiddling with the flowers and the grass and everything. And when anybody asked me of authority, a lager, uh, a Führer or a capo or a assessment, I would say that the, the, the Werkschutz told me to do that, and that one told me to do that. And I made myself, I just lie there, and, and during lunchtime, I would run to the kitchen to get some food. And I was caught a couple of times to go work, and Maidanek was a camp of torture. The Ukrainians were the main gods of Maidanek, and they loved to kill people with spades. So every day there was selection for guest chambers, but there was also killing. People that went out or Arbeitskommando, they were they came back with 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 with, uh, with bodies of people that were killed by the during the war. So you cannot imagine what Maidanek was all about, and I can't imagine that I survived that. After three months, I was selected to go to become a slave laborer sold by the Nazis by the SS to a company called Hasak, Hugo Schneider Aktiengesellschaft, and I was sent to a place called Skarzysko. Now Skarzysko was a camp, a work, so so-called working camp. As a matter of fact, after the war, a man who was there, a writer, and who survived the, that camp, uh, his name was Mordechai Strigler, he wrote a book in Yiddish called, in, published in Argentina in 1948, and he called it in the Fabriken von Toy, in the factories of death. Because in that camp, you worked, they worked you to death. They, there was selection for shooting in the forest. We were, li we were living in such conditions that people were dying day, day in and day out. There was a typhoid epidemic. It, 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 is, it was quite an incredible place to even imagine. The interior administration of these working camp often and including ours, was Jewish. We had a Jewish commander, a woman, Markovichova, who was a terrible woman. Before the war, she was a, a, a headmistress of a Hasidic shoe married to a Hasid, which she, uh, uh, during the war, she, uh, 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 she, she uh, divorced and married somebody else. And they, they were the first ones that were brought to that camp and they became they, they called them the Prominente. And then I didn't know why, but they, they, their barrack was called the White House. They lived very well. The Jew, there was a Jewish police and they had separate barracks. And fortunately for me, providentially, I believe, 
when I arrived and they said we're allocating people to work, I was allocated to work for the policeman by the name of Katz. And when he asked me my name, he said, I know you family, I come from Lodge. And he said to me, my wife, uh, I've got my wife in the police barrack. Unfortunately, she's ill. And uh, if you, after working for 12 hours, if you come back and you become a nurse, uh, I will look after you. I will make things easier for you. So this is what happened to me. And this was again, Providence. He, I would work 12 hours a day. And fortunately, his commando, his work group was working in the outside, wasn't working where they made mines, where they made bullets, where they made grenades. And people, the Jewish people, People that worked in those factories had no protective clothing. The Polish Christians that came from the vicinity that came every day to work, they had protective clothes like the firemen, and so have the Germans that worked there. But we didn't, they didn't have it. And they worked with acids. One of them was called Pikrina, I found after the war. It was picric acid. It made people yellow, and within three months, they would die because it would infect their livers and their lungs, and they could last more than about two to three months. In fact, uh, 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 one of my cousins from Wuj arrived while I was there, uh, Michal. I was his at his wedding in 1938. He married uh, a cousin of mine, Moshe Shloim Levinson's second daughter. And, and he started working with this yellow stuff and he died within three months. He started swelling up and he died, unfortunately, in, in that camp. Now, I'm only going to tell you one more thing about the camp because time is running out and I, I, there's a limit to how long one can talk and how, how much I can put myself through. I lasted for about a year in that camp. And one of the reasons why I lasted, I had typhoid and I was saved by another Jewish policeman from being taken to the uh, sick bay because from the sick bay, they used to take you to the forest and shoot you. And, uh, and so I was saved from by another policeman. Then came the end. It was Tishabov. That's all I remember. It was the day of Tishabov. And they always used to choose days like that. We came back from work. By that time, of course, his wife had died. She died within five, six months. But Katz always still looked after me. And he tried to help me. So we came from work. And we were told that we can't go to the barracks, we're not getting our soup and our piece of bread. We must go in front of the commander who will sit in his office in front of the window. We must give our name. So we went there and we gave our name. So I went and I gave my name and I saw him make a tick on a piece of paper. After everybody gave their names, we were chased to the barracks, we were given our soup and piece of bread, we went to sleep. In the morning, we thought we were going to work but we were woken up with the Jewish police and we were told to stand on a roll call. And after a couple of hours, the commander came with a lot of lists and he started calling out names. And he said to us that he's calling out names and those people he's calling out names might stand on the other side. And those people are going to go with the train to the next camp because this camp is being evacuated. And then... The others are going to have to walk because there aren't sufficient trucks to take everybody by train to the next camp. So he called out my name. He called out my best friend's name. And to, we went to stand on the other side. There were, as I, as I told you, there were a lot of prominent people that, uh, that were in the administration of the camp and uh, the doctors of the camp, they, you know, that for those people that still had money, because the people that came from the area originally had the, they had the arrangements with, with Christian friends who used to bring them food and other things. So they could even get medications if you had money. So these doctors not only looked after us, but they also looked after the Ukrainian families because they had their families there. And also the Germans were also used there. Uh, this woman was like the chief doctor and she was on very good term with the Amashimo Schultz the commander of our camp. So he called out his, her mother's name because she was prominent. So she was allowed to have her mother. People had their women and children even in, in that camp, you know, those that were prominent. And uh, he didn't call out her name. So she ran towards him 
I didn't hear what she was saying, but she was pushing, pulling his sleeve, and she obviously asked him, why don't you let me go with my mother? He was on very good terms. They always used to walk and laugh together. And we used to watch them, how friendly they were. And he wouldn't let her. He was pushing her back, pushing her back, and pushing her back. And eventually, he lost his temper. He called the mother, took out his revolver, shot the mother, and shot her. And then we knew, we looked around, the people that he called out the names, and they were all people that were yellow, people with rags. I even didn't have shoes by that time. I had rags on my legs tied together with, with, with wire, you know, you know, stuff from cement packs and stuff like that. I had no shoes. My shoes that I came from, from uh, Majdanek had, had, had gone and I couldn't get new ones. So we started running and we started hiding. And, uh, you know, what do you do? So I, st I ran. The barracks were built on stilts. So I ran underneath one of the barracks and I burrowed myself like an animal trying to hide. And providentially, with the Reboi Rishilism help, who found me, because the Jewish police, the SS, the, the Ukrainian guard, they all started surrounding everybody and making a new roll call. Because he was now going to, if he had 500 names on his list, and I don't know how many, he had quite a lot, he was going to get as many people, but he was going to choose them. So they were pulling us out. Cats found me. He said, look, let me help you. Took me to the police barrack, took all my rags off, washed me, combed my hair, took lipstick from his dead wife, rubbed it into my cheeks, and gave me proper boots like the police wore, not the police hat, but an ordinary hat. He gave me a shirt, a jacket, sh proper shoes, proper, uh, and everything. And I looked like a human being. He said, go out with God's help, you will survive. And we had a new roll call and everybody was surrounded now by a heavy guard of, 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 of SS, Ukrainian with machine gun, and they were watching us. He went from row to row to row to row. Next to me, my best friend Yakov stood and he was in regs like I was before that. Schultz walked and took people out. And then when he took somebody out, the Jewish police or one of the guard would take them and then they surrounded them in a kind of uh, like, like, a, like a ring and they were keeping them in and if anybody tried to run away between the legs they would shoot him on the spot there was no more nonsense about going by trains so he came and was taking people out he came and his, I was standing in the front row because nobody wanted to be and I was a youngster they pushed me to the front row and he came and stood in front of me and I was sure that he was going to take me, he recognized me, he was going to take me, but he didn't. He went and he took Yaakov without looking at him and threw him into one of the guards who put him into that ring. And of course, the next day or the day after, uh, after everybody was taken away and they, they, all the condemned people were shot in the forest, we were in forest in the camouflage, place these these camps there were three camps work a work b work c and this is uh, uh, they took us and we came, we went to change to hover and i was there working very hard but fortunately in that camp there was a wonderful jewish commander and his name was franco unfortunately he lost his life in buchenwald uh, and he made so that we never saw a nazi in the camp nobody died in the three, four months that I was there, I was there from August. It was from Tishabov. It was the end of July or beginning of August, the 1944, until uh, the end of December or middle of December, I was there. And in that time, nobody died. So much so, he had such good relationship with the Germans that when one of the young boys had appendicitis, he, would, he sent him to the Polish hospital in Częstochowa, and he came back and he recovered and he survived the war. So this was an this was an unbelievable. This is where I had my bar mitzvah because I found out of Gottel Eisner, who was a friend of my father. They went to the yeshiva together, and he decided that I was going to be thirteen. I wasn't quite sure how old I was, but he he was at my circumcision, and he decided that he was going to make me bar mitzvah. So at midnight, because we had to be very careful, he had film, he had a talis, he had a sidur, and I made the blessings, and I became bar mitzvah. And he said in Yiddish, with God's help, as the Ibel Eben Hitler, and not the Gebenched. 
and he benched me and he said, with God's help, you will outlive Hitler. And then from there, I was unfortunately taken to Buchenwald. From Buchenwald, I went to a place called Kolditz. And then Kolditz, I was there for about four months in Germany, also working. And again, I got to tell you the story. And I don't, it's very important because the Rebbeinishim works in different ways. It's difficult to know how, what is going to happen to you. When we arrived in Kolditz, from Buchenwald, the SS were already elderly men and the officers, there were no camps. They, it was a hole and there were bunks in there and they, look, you would lock, they would lock us up at night. And during the day, we worked with Panzerfaust. With the, with the, a Panzerfaust was one of these uh, uh, anti-tank rockets. We were very primitive anti-tank rockets that the Germans used to use against tanks. And we made these things. But when we arrived there, there was a roll call. And the first thing he said, ob da ist kleine Buben, they mussten aussteigen. When, if there are any youngsters, they must step out. And nobody used to step out because we knew young children are not good for work. They mustn't step out. But I, for some reason, I decided to step out. I automatically, I went and I stood out. I was the only one. And then they allocated people to work, work groups. And then after that, he took me to the SS kitchen and said, you are going to work here. So can you imagine working for three to four months in the SS kitchen, cleaning the pots, eating, and uh, I ate my fill every day. So much so, I found Harav Godel Eisner in Kolditz. He came from a different place. He came from Czestochowa. I don't know whether I can't remember whether he came via Buchenwald or by the Schlieben, but he came to Kolditz and I found him there. So in the evening when I came and I got my soup and bread, I gave it to him. He survived the war. He remarried. He went to Israel, became a Rosh Hashiva, and he, he, he remarried, had children, and he became a, a very famous man. And, and he lived in his late 90s and he only died a couple of few years ago. And that's that's, how, that's what happened when I arrived in Kolditz. I was there for, for until, I think, the beginning of April. Then they chased us out on a death march. And we, 1,500 of us left that place. And only half of us arrived in Trezenstadt. And I was liberated on the 8th of May by the Russians uh, in Trezenstadt in 1945. And, that, and that's my story. That's part of a little story. Thank you, very, thank you very much for listening to me. We certainly want to thank Mr. Guta for um, exposing himself again and opening himself up because it's a, it's apparent. I know from talking to my own mother, but I can you can see it clearly that every time he tells a story, it it it, it tears open his heart again, and it's as if he's reliving it. And it's, it's really a privilege for us to hear the story, but um, even more so because we know, um, you know how meaningful it is and, and, and how much of a witness he has become. And we certainly appreciate his taking the time and opening himself up to us today. And we wanna wish him a, a long life and, and, uh, and a happy life and a meaningful life where he can continue to share his words and share his wisdom with uh, coming generations as, as is the purpose of this evening. And again, uh, Mr. Guter, I think anybody who was here was deeply touched by what you had to say. And we wish you only the opportunity to, to live many more years and to be able to continue to make a difference in the world by letting people know of your story, what you went through and all of the Jews that you, that you passed by and that you took with you and that you interacted with through those uh, numbers of years in hell that you that you experienced, and that you're, and that you know the way that today you have been able to, you know, become real again, become a person again. And I know that how difficult it was for my own mother to have gone through the war, and then, you know, in a matter of a couple of years to get married and have children, as if nothing had happened, until you scratched her a little bit and you saw that that it really was there. And we uh, we we appreciate your opening up and you're speaking to us today. I do, I, I do want to close um, 
by once again thanking the extended Shentao family for making this event possible and for the events we've done before and the upcoming ones that we are planning to do every year in memory of, of, of Mr. Shentao so that his work, like Mr. Guter's work, of making sure that the world never forgets what happened and that we, the Jews, also never forget what happened and that we were able to move on in the future and to guarantee that that we do everything we can to, to make the world a place where these types of things will not be accepted and won't be able to continue. So the, uh, the, the assistance of the Shento family in making that happen and certainly people like Mr. Guter who have opened themselves up to do that for us. We wanna thank you all. We appreciate all that you've done. Uh, every one of you that is, every one of you in the Shento family who makes this possible, Mr. Guter who does so um, and all of the other witnesses who give of their, their blood and their sweat and their tears in being able to open themselves up to us. So we want to uh, thank you all for joining with us. We had just close to 100 people with us, which for Zoom is an extraordinarily large number. Um, and, and there's good reason for it, because it's uh, those who, knew, who Mr. Shentown knew that, that, uh, that whatever he did, it was something that was worthy of your time. And any of you who knew Mr. Gutter or have heard of him, knew that you were going to have an evening where you're going to learn things and feel things that you perhaps haven't felt. Very often we speak about how terrible things are today with the COVID and, and it is and it, in all different ways. But I think it's evenings like this that put it into perspective and to allow us to realize um, sometimes how depraved the world can be and how through our efforts, the world can become a better place. So again, I wanna thank everyone for participating, for the Shentaos fa family, for making it possible, for, for Mr. Pinchas Guter, for opening his heart to us again. And uh, we wanna wish everyone a good night and hope that um, you'll continue to participate in these things and to make sure that the world realizes what did happen and through our efforts to make it possible that these types of things will not happen, not only just not to us, but to anyone in the world. So thank you once again. We appreciate you joining with us. And I, Rabbi Avram Rothman, um, really do appreciate what, uh, what all, of, all of your coming and participating and carrying on with uh, the knowledge and the stories from one of the darkest times in modern Jewish history or in world, Jewish, world history. Thank you very much. And everyone should please have a good night. We'll see you. Shalom, Shalom, Thank you. Thank you very much.